are fighting tyrants. I believe that if the tyrants are removed, that there'll be a great deal more peace and chances for peace in the Middle East. And the tyrants, if you can name names. Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Saudi Arabia are the big four. And then there's Libya. There's a, there's a North Korean problem, too, that we'll have to deal with, although that's not directly related to the Middle East, yeah, except yeah. insofar as North Korea has helped them. You can't solve all problems, I grant that. I mean, I'm, I'm a student of Machiavelli. I wrote a book on Machiavelli. And I know the struggle against evil is going to go on forever. 9-11 was a huge uh, wake-up call, uh, reality impinged, and the president decided, in my view correctly, that to simply stand back and let things develop around the world was a recipe for more 9-11s, was a recipe for death and for tyranny, uh, for veiling, and, and that we had to be active in the world. The thing to us is that this war, uh, if you want to use that term, let's say this engagement, all right? War liberation, that's what we like okay. to call it. Uh, I mean, I'm going to pray, as we all do, uh, for the success of American arms. Uh, I'm going to uh, pray for low casualties on all sides, uh, for the swift overthrow of this dictator. Um, I'm going to feel some fear, of course, because people are in danger and they are in harm's way. Um, but mostly I'm going to feel confidence because I think the war is just. Um, I think America is going to win. I think um, the West, the whole West is going to benefit. Our job is just to think. And if our ideas get adopted, and if our ideas turn into policy, wonderful. That's what we're here for. I think that the report of the UN weapons inspectors was surreal. Uh, we've got a situation here where we know that there's anthrax and smallpox in this country. We know that the country's the size of California. We know that there is a 13-year history of the Iraqis concealing the presence of these weapons. What will happen if, at the end of the war, the Americans do not find any weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? Well, I believe that the liberation of Iraq, the freeing of the Iraqi people, uh, would be justification enough. I, I find them amusing. Sometimes they are really terrifying in the way they think, the way they would like to shape the world, the way they think they can impose their doctrine and their ideology on everybody else, even if force is needed. You worried? No, we are not worried at all. We have our alliances, we have our friends, but I don't think they have any chance whatsoever of uh, translating this agenda into policies. There is no yeah. question Saddam Hussein has not cooperated. He's playing the game. He wants to string it out. And uh, intelligence from U.S. and British sources say he's moved some of his really heinous weapons to Syria and Libya. We will make a lot of people very nervous. And we will hear, for example, the Mubarak regime in Egypt or the Saudi royal family thinking about this idea that these Americans are spreading a democracy in this part of the world they will say you make us very nervous and our response should be good um, Syria is making you know and the you know, Syrian regime is making comments that they're nervous that they think that they're next نلتقي اليوم والمعاناة تعم أرض سوريا ولا تبقي مكانا للفرح في أي زاوية من زوايا الوطن فالأمن والأمان 
غابا عن شوارع البلاد وأزقتها نلتقي اليوم وهناك أمهات فقدت أبنائها خيرة أبنائها وأسر فقدت معيلها وأطفال تيتموا وإخوة تفرقوا بين شهيد ونازح ومفقود فالفكرة دفاع والموقف دفاع والبناء دفاع والحفاظ على ممتلكات الشعب دفاع يسمونها ثورة وهي لا علاقة لها بالثورات لا من قريب ولا من بعيد الثورة بحاجة لمفكرين الثورة تبنى على فكر فأين هو المفكر؟ من يعرف مفكر لهذه الثورة؟ الثورات بحاجة لقادة من يعرف من هو قائد هذه الثورة؟ الثورات تبنى على العلم والفكر لا تبنى على الجهل تبنى على دفع البلاد إلى الأمام لا إعادتها قرون إلى الوراء تبنى على تعميم النور على المجتمع لا على قطع الكهرباء عن الناس الثورة تكون عادة ثورة الشعب لا ثورة ثورة المستوردين من الخارج لكي يثوروا على الشعب هي ثورة من أجل مصالح الشعب ليست ضد مصالح الشعب فبالله عليكم هل هذه ثورة وهل هؤلاء ثوار إنهم حفنة من المجرمين خلف كل ذلك كان التكفيريون يعملون في الصفوف الخلفية عبر عمليات التبجير والقتل الجماعي تاركين العصابات في الواجهة داعمين لها من الخلف وكلما كان الجيش والشعب يدا بيد يصد قتلهم واجرامهم كانوا يقتربون من الانهيار عندها لم يجد التكفيريون بدا مما ليس منه بد فانتقلوا للقتال في الصفوف الاماميه واستلموا دفه سفينه الدم والقتل والتنكيل ولان الفكر التكفيري فكر دخيل على بلادنا كان لا بد من استيراده من الخارج افرادا وأفكارا وهنا انقلبت المعادلة إرهابيون تكفيريون إرهابيون يحملون فكر القاعدة This generation of Americans has been tested by crises that steeled our resolve and proved our resilience. A decade of war is now ending. An economic recovery has begun. America's possibilities are limitless, for we possess all the qualities that this world without boundaries demands. Youth and drive diversity and openness, an endless capacity for risk and a gift for reinvention. My fellow Americans, we are made for this moment and we will seize it so long as we seize it together. I recognize that many Americans are tired of war. As president, nothing is more wrenching than signing a letter to a family of the fallen. We're looking into the eyes of a child who will grow up without a mother or father. I will not keep Americans in harm's way a single day longer than is absolutely required for our national security. But we must finish the job we started in Afghanistan and end this war responsibly. We, the people, still believe that enduring security and lasting peace do not require perpetual war. I'm joined now by Margaret, who is at the Food Party headquarters in Tel Aviv tonight. Margaret, it, we know who the winner apparently is, and that's Benjamin Netanyahu, but there's something else that's happening right underneath right here. There's another story, another drama playing out. <laughs> Yes, the drama, Gwen, was not that Bibi Netanyahu won, though he won much more narrowly than people thought, but that the second place finisher was not the old traditional labor war horse of Shelley Yakimovich, nor even the hot ticket 
you know, multimillionaire uh, software developer and sort of ultra rightist uh, Naftali Bennett, but this centrist candidate, Yair Lapid, whom you just saw in my tape piece, who really spoke consistently to and about the middle class and their concerns. Now, just five days ago, he was projected to win something like 11 seats in the, in the Knesset. He's now projected to win 19. So does this mean, Margaret, that Bibi Netanyahu, even though he is the winner, now has to look to him to form a coalition? He does, Gwen, and in fact, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was just here. He said he's already reached out. It was clear he meant to Lapid. Even before tonight's result, advisors to both camps were saying he was likely to reach out to Lapid first. It's really where Netanyahu goes to next. Does he go to the right? Does he go to the left? Does he go to fringe parties that will influence the tenor of his next government? Welcome to JerusalemOnline.com News. U.S. President Barack Obama on Monday called Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to congratulate him, saying that he looked forward to working with the new government and reiterated his commitment to the deep and enduring bonds between Israel and the United States. Word of a bold strike by America's biggest ally in the Middle East, Israel. An air attack across the Syrian border. Everyone waiting for what happens next. There are conflicting claims about an apparent airstrike by Israeli forces inside Syria. Regional security sources quoted by Reuters say the Israeli attack targeted a convoy of trucks allegedly carrying weapons to the Lebanese group Hezbollah. Israel has refused to comment, but Syrian state news agency says Israel attacked a scientific research facility, killing two workers. Rula Amin has the latest from Beirut. What we know, according to the Syrian government, is that the target was a military scientific research center. They say two, as you said, two people were killed, three people, uh, five people were injured, and a lot of damage to the building. It happened in an area in the countryside of the capital, Damascus. If confirmed, it will be the first time in decades that Israel has launched an attack on another state, not in response to military action. If indeed this Israeli military strike inside Syria is confirmed, Moscow has condemned it in the strongest possible terms, saying that it was unprovoked and it was a strike against a sovereign state that is in violation of international law and is unacceptable. Now, what we understand is that Israeli warplanes bombed, and this is according to Syrian sources, a military research center outside Damascus, where at least two site workers were killed. Now, there are some reports also suggesting that the warplanes bombed a convoy of weapons that were making their way from Syria to Lebanon, allegedly to arm Hezbollah. Now, the Syrians have denied this. Now, we are hearing from an unnamed American official that prior to this incident, Tel Aviv had in fact informed Washington that it was planning a military attack inside Syria. There is the opinion that this attack could consolidate military forces inside Syria against a common Arab enemy, namely Israel, and that it will merely bring them closer together and divert them away from fighting each other and instead turn their forces against Israel. The first of 400 U.S. troops have begun arriving in Turkey to begin operating Patriot missile batteries along the border with Syria. Turkey asked NATO for the Patriot system designed to intercept aircraft or missiles in November to help bolster its border security after repeated episodes of gunfire from war-torn Syria spilling onto its territory. I cannot add anything to what you have read in the newspapers about the, uh, the, what happened in the, uh, Syria several days ago, but I keep telling, uh, frankly, that we said, and that's one another proof that when we say something, we mean it, we say that we, uh, we don't think that it should be allowable to bring uh, advanced weapon systems into, uh, into Lebanon. You know, I'm, I'm always encountering so many conspiracy theories that are totally off base, wild, made up stuff that the media in the region promotes about the United States that is absolutely untrue. Our response has been, nobody will either believe it or we can't possibly contest it. I take a different view. I think we ought to be in there every single day. You know, I made a point uh, of reaching out to Al Jazeera when I became Secretary of State because it was unrelentlessly, or it was relentlessly, 
uh, negative about us. And I said, you know, come on. That, that is not only inaccurate, but it's deeply unfair. A regional security source is quoted by the Reuters news agency say that Israel, uh, Israeli aircraft attacked a convoy of trucks carrying weapons towards the border with Lebanon. A Syrian state news agency, however, says Israeli jets have bombed a scientific research center in Jamriah on the outskirts of the capital, Damascus. Lebanon's military says Israeli jets flew into Syrian airspace three times. What we've heard is that there were two targets. The first was this research and development center associated with uh, the Syrian government, which um, has in the past been uh, reportedly associated with Syria's chemical weapons program. The second is a weapons convoy, which, according to some reports, included advanced surface-to-air missiles. So with regard to the R&D center, they were perhaps trying to prevent chemical weapons from falling into the hand of members of the opposition. Apparently, there had been fighting in the vicinity of this center in the last few days. كان معندا وكان مستمرا بالانتشار وبدا يتغلغل في قلب المجتمعات الغربيه نفسها فاتت هذه الاحداث في العالم العربي وخاصه في سوريا كفرصه سانحه لهذه القوى لكي تقوم اقصد القوى الغربيه لتقوم بنقل كل هؤلاء الارهابيين او العدد الممكن العدد الاكبر الممكن الى سوريا لتحويل سوريا الى ارض الجهاد وبالتالي يتخلصوا من خصمين مزعجين بنفس الوقت يتخلصوا من الارهابيين ويضعفوا سوريا العقده المزعجه بالنسبه للغرب Because Assad is a uh, Assad government, Assad regime is pretty paranoid, isn't it, that Israel is joining the rebels' fight to oust it from power. Well, I, I'm not sure that uh, I mean, they, they've been saying from the very beginning that the rebels are supported by foreign forces, uh, the forces of imperialism, which would include the United States and Israel. Um, I, I think also, though, the Israelis have already warned the Syrians against um, transferring advanced weapons, advanced conventional weapons or chemical weapons to Hezbollah. And they've also been worried that as a result of the fighting, some of these weapons would fall into the hands of terrorist groups. So. Part of what they were doing perhaps was preventive, to prevent these weapons mm. from falling into the hands of terrorists or Hezbollah, in part with deterrence against the Syrian government, to say that if you transfer these weapons, you will have, the, you have to face the possibility of a broader conflict with Israel at a time when you can't really afford a second war. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Uh, back to the briefing room for your daily briefing. I do not have any announcements to make at the top, so I will go straight to Pardon. Darlene. Yes, just one question on another issue, please. The mm -hmm. Syrian government said today, uh, or warned of a possible surprise response to Israel's attack. Uh, are you concerned that this will happen and that this situation will escalate? Again, I, I would refer you to the Israeli government uh, on, on, on matters like that. Jay, on, on, the, on the job Sorry. stores. Go ahead, Jessica. Okay. Can I follow up first on uh, on Syria? Is mm -hmm. is uh, in light of the Israeli strike there? How concerned is the U.S. that Hezbollah is getting weapons transferred? Again, I'm not going to. I don't have anything for you on questions about those reports. I would refer you to the uh, Israeli government. Okay. A U.S. official is quoted talking about this. You can't give us anything. Uh, again, I don't have anything yep. for you. I'm curious okay. what the what the message will be from this White House when the Vice President goes to visit with the Syrian opposition leader in Germany in the next couple days. Well, Wolfgang, let me begin by saying thank you and President Obama and I and nearly all of our partners and allies are convinced that President Assad, a, a tyrant, hell-bent on clinging to power, is no longer fit to lead the Syrian people and he must go. I'm sure that in our conversations and the conversations of our international partners with the Syrian opposition, 
this, this uh, you know, various approaches will be discussed. Uh, but what is unquestionable, I think, uh, for uh, the Syrian opposition, for the Syrian people, is that Assad has to go. Well, from Washington, I'm joined by Dr. Webster Griffin Topley, author and historian. Welcome to the program. So, Doctor, uh, we see a soft stance by the uh, Syrian armed forces towards the Israeli aggression on Syria, on the research center there. At the White House, we had Jay Carney freaking out, saying, no, no, Assad must leave, Assad must leave. And I think people interpreted this call from Khatib as a sign that the Syrian rebellion may be near collapse. Otherwise, he's basically asking for an armistice. He's asking for a truce. Why would he do that? Not if he's winning, but if he's losing. And at that point, the Israelis rush in with the bombing, and we have a bombing also at the UN, the U.S. Embassy in, uh, in Turkey. Now, all of that doesn't exactly help the uh, Syrian National Coalition and the Free Syrian Army because they are acutely embarrassed because now it's clear who they are. They're in a united front with Israel. They're the infantry of the uh, Israeli Defense Forces. Uh, very, very embarrassing for them. They claim, originally they claimed that the, the Israeli bombing was not the Israelis but some mortar shells that the Syrian rebels had fired. And now the, the, the latest thing I heard an hour or two ago was that the Syrian rebels are attacking Assad because he doesn't have the guts to attack uh, the Israelis. And of course, why would he? This is close to the border. The wreckage of the plane might fall with the nuclear. Our brave men and women in uniform, tempered by the flames of battle, are unmatched in skill and courage. Our citizens, seared by the memory of those we have lost, know too well the price that is paid for liberty. The knowledge of their sacrifice will keep us forever vigilant against those who would do us harm. But we are also heirs to those who won the peace and not just the war, who turned sworn enemies into the surest of friends, and we must carry those lessons into this time as well. We will defend our people and uphold our values through strength of arms and the rule of law. The international community has been speaking with one voice, saying very clearly that Colonel Gaddafi's brutal attacks on his own people are unacceptable and will not be tolerated. Gaddafi has lost the legitimacy to govern, and it is time for him to go without further violence or delay. Saturday's unanimous UN Security Council For months, resolution the world was a has borne witness beginning. to the Assad regime's contempt for its own people. In peaceful demonstrations across the nation, Syrians are demanding their universal human rights. The regime has answered their demands with empty promises and horrific violence, torturing opposition leaders, laying siege to cities, slaughtering thousands of unarmed civilians, including children. The Assad government has now been condemned by countries in all parts of the world and can look only to Iran for support for its brutal and unjust crackdown. This morning, President Obama called on Assad to step aside and announced the strongest set of sanctions to date targeting the Syrian government. These sanctions include the energy sector to increase pressure on the regime. The transition to democracy in Syria has begun, and it's time for Assad to get out of the way. As President Obama said this morning, no outside power can or should impose on this transition. It is up to the Syrian people to choose their own leaders in a democratic system based on the rule of law and dedicated to protecting the rights of all citizens, and we will stand up for their universal rights and dignity. By pressuring the regime and Assad personally to get out of the way of this transition. <laughs> لا يعني بأي شكل من الأشكال أن نقبل بتفسيرها إن لم يكن يتوافق مع رؤيتنا ولا نقبل بأي تأويل لهذه المبادرات إلا بالطريقة التي تخدم المصلحة 
السورية وفي هذا الإطار نتحدث عن مبادرة جنيف التي أيدتها سوريا ولكن كان فيها بند غامض هو بند المرحلة الانتقالية طبعا هو غير مفسر لسبب بسيط لأننا عندما نتحدث عن مرحلة انتقالية أول شيء نتساءل انتقال من أين إلى أين أو من ماذا إلى ماذا هل ننتقل من بلد حر مستقل إلى بلد تحت الاحتلال مثلا هل ننتقل من بلد فيه دولة إلى بلد ليس فيه دولة وحالة فوضى مطلقة أم هل ننتقل من قرار وطني مستقل إلى تسليم هذا القرار للأجانب طبعا الخصوم يريدون الثلاثة سوية بالنسبة لنا في مثل هذا الظرف المرحلة الانتقالية هي الانتقال من اللا استقرار إلى الاستقرار أي تفسير آخر لا يعنينا On the humanitarian corridors with close air support, no. Uh, any uh, use of force, uh, any threat of, use of the use of force uh, will be unacceptable. The situation on the ground uh, requires not more uh, military uh, assets, but immediate ceasefire and immediate end of violence. And persistence of those who say that priority number one is the removal of President Assad, I think it's the... Uh, single biggest reason for continued uh, tragedy in Syria. Well, I believe the red line is uh, a common line for all of us. Uh, we are categorically against any use of uh, weapons of uh, mass destruction, be it chemical, be it biological, be it nuclear. And uh, we are very seriously engaged uh, in daily efforts in coordination with the Americans, Europeans, with other partners to make sure that we know Uh, what is the state of the uh, chemical weapons in Syria? And we have uh, very uh, sustainable uh, information. We are confident that uh, as long as the government keeps control of those weapons, uh, the situation is safe. Syria is being destroyed. Yeah, the, the region is, 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 is being pushed into a... Uh, uh, you know, a situation that is extremely bad and extremely important for the entire world. That is why I believe the Security Council simply cannot, uh, uh, you know, continue to say, you know, we, we, we are in disagreement, therefore let's wait for better times. The United Nations has no choice but to remain engaged with this problem, whether I am there or not. The moment I feel that I am totally useless. I, won't, I will not stay one minute more. I didn't want this job. I, I didn't look for it. I don't need it as a job. Uh, so if I'm doing it, it's because maybe stupidly, I feel sense of duty. Of course, decisions made by the CIA certainly resonate all across the globe. Uh, what are the implications of uh, Petraeus's resignation, uh, you think, for the U.S.? Well, it's a good question and one that hasn't been asked enough in this scandal. If the old adage is true that nothing in politics happens by accident, then I think that's nowhere more true than it is when it comes to these political sex scandals, as we've seen over the years. We can start to, to see some of the pieces of this puzzle emerging as it becomes clear now that, uh, that there is the indication that he will not be testifying in upcoming congressional hearings into what happened in Benghazi in September. And because of that, some key information about what happened in Benghazi might not come to light, including some interesting information that just emerged in uh, recently that, in fact, last month, uh, uh, General Petraeus's alleged mistress, this uh, Broadwell, was going around uh, giving uh, speeches uh, about how the CIA annex in, in uh, Benghazi was being used as a secret prison, which is why it was, why it was attacked in September. I want to welcome you to the Council on Foreign Relations, and I'm Richard Haas, President of the CFR. For those of you who don't know who we are, we're an independent, nonpartisan membership organization, a think tank, and a publisher, and we are dedicated to improving the understanding of the world and the foreign policy choices facing this country. And this afternoon, we are honored to host Hillary Rodham Clinton during her last 24 hours as President Obama's first Secretary of State, immediately after which, I'm told, she might be expected to party like it's Cartagena all over again. <laughs> more countries than ever have a voice in global debates. We see more paths to power opening up as nations gain influence 
through the strength of their economies rather than their militaries. And political and technological changes are empowering non-state actors like activists, corporations, and terrorist networks. At the same time, we face challenges from financial contagion to climate change to human and wildlife trafficking that spill across borders and defy unilateral solutions. As President Obama has said, the old post-war architecture is crumbling under the weight of new threats. So the geometry of global power has become more distributed and diffuse as the challenges we face have become more complex and cross-cutting. So the question we ask ourselves every day is what does this mean for America? And then we go on to say, how can we advance our own interests and also uphold a just rules-based international order where once a few strong columns could hold up the weight of the world, today we need a dynamic mix of materials and structures. Now, of course, American military and economic strength will remain the foundation of our global leadership. As we saw from the intervention to stop a massacre in Libya to the raid that brought bin Laden to justice, there will always be times when it is necessary and just to use force. America's ability to project power all over the globe remains essential. Algerians go to the polls to choose a new parliament, but the opposition say the election was rigged. With a new majority in Parliament, is the old ruling party likely to change? And is Algeria now immune from the Arab Spring? This is Inside Story. Because of the fluidity and the fact that there is a lot of planning going on, I cannot give you any further details at this time about the current situation on the ground. But I can say that more broadly, what we are seeing uh, in Mali, in Algeria, uh, reflects uh, the broader strategic challenge. But when you deal with these uh, uh, relentless uh, uh, terrorists, uh, life is not in any way precious to them. We know two Americans at this natural gas facility in Algeria managed to escape, and they are in London now, uh, managed to get to a flight to get to London. We don't know the fate of other Americans there. Uh, we know that the Algerians, uh, with helicopters and special forces, stormed this gas plant uh, today, and a major battle with Islamist extremists uh, happened. Several people were killed. Uh, we just don't know the outcome yet. We do know that this is largely over at this point, uh, but there are a number of people who are unaccounted for, and we're trying to get the ground truth of this drama that has been going on for several days in Algeria. We strongly condemn uh, what has taken place. It's a serious matter when Americans uh, and others are taken hostage. And uh, what we're going to do is continue to look at that situation and uh, determine uh, what steps need to be taken. Uh, I think Americans, Americans ought to be assured that we'll take all necessary and proper steps to, uh, to deal with this kind of situation. It is a very serious matter when Americans uh, are taken hostage uh, along with others. The terror strike came without warning Wednesday morning when an estimated 20 gunmen first attacked a bus carrying workers, escorted by two cars carrying security teams. At least one worker was killed. Then the terrorists moved on to the compound, where they are now holed up with the American and other Western hostages. Once militants stormed the complex, they smashed down the doors of the residential buildings in a hunt for Americans and other foreigners. Another witness described to the New York Times terrorists shooting a European in the back while other hostages watched. When you don't know what's out there, uh, and you, we know that the terrorists are dressed the same as the security forces. It was a, a, a huge decision. Do you, do you stay or do you go? But when this incident is finally over, we know we face a continuing, ongoing uh, problem. And we're going to do everything we can uh, to work together to confront and uh, disrupt al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. We cannot accept attacks against our citizens and our interests abroad. Neither can we accept an Al-Qaeda safe haven anywhere 
you know, in we, the world. We, we are going to be uh, uh, taking steps to provide assistance uh, to them. Uh, and with regards to uh, AQIM, uh, with regards to Al Qaeda in general, uh, I guess, uh, you know, I, I say this from my own background and having dealt with uh, Al Qaeda, uh, they, they are a threat. They're a threat to uh, our country. They're a threat to uh, the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, wherever they locate uh, and try to establish a base for operations, uh, I think that, uh, that constitutes a threat. Those who would wantonly attack our country and our people will have no place to hide. Algeria's Prime Minister says last week's attack on the In Amenas gas plant, in which at least 38 mostly foreign workers died, was coordinated by a Canadian. Abdel Malik Salal said the Canadian citizen, whom he named only as Chidad, was among the 29 gunmen killed. Canada says it's seeking more information. La plupart ont été most of the workers were freed, Salal told reporters, except five foreigners who are still missing. We don't know where they are. Maybe they're in hiding, or they fled, or they were killed. God have mercy on them. Dozens more bodies, the death toll now standing tonight at 81. And as we hear more now from those who survived, word of a chilling message from the man who claims to have planned it all. As the bodies of more hostages were being discovered inside the Saharan Desert facility today, many badly burned or maimed. The absolute horror of their experience became clear in recordings of phone calls made by one hostage in broken English to authorities outside as broadcast on Algerian TV. We have prisoners, we have hostages with bombs taped on the body. Please uh, call back, please call back. Intelligence officials believe this is the mastermind of the attack, Mokhtar Bel Mokhtar, a ruthless rogue al-Qaeda leader who bizarrely also runs an African organized crime network that reportedly has made tens of millions of dollars in ransom from kidnappings and the successful smuggling of diamonds, drugs and cigarettes. His nickname is Mr. Marlboro. إحنا نشوفوا هذا الدول اللي فاتتنا باش فاتنا فاتنا بالعلم والدين تاع الإسلام This was the scene over two decades ago in Algeria The only tapes released of a high council assassination This is how a leader's murder eventually leads to a long and bloody civil war, an attack on an animal oil field, and the RCM police on the scene. During the 1950s until 1962, Mohamed Boudiaf was a member of Algeria's National Liberation Front, the FLN. Their job was an armed insurrection against France, years before Algeria gained its independence. However, by 1956, Boudiaf had found himself in prison after being captured by French forces. He wasn't released until 1962, after Algeria gained its independence. With the fall of the French from Algeria, the FLN split into rival factions, eventually forcing Boudiaf out of the way and out of the country. Spending 27 years in exile in the country of Morocco, the military invited Boudiaf back to become chairman of the High Council of State. In office, Boudiaf promised a war against violence and corruption. The FLN, the former ruling party and army that had originally supported him, were stunned in May of 1992 when he ordered the arrest of retired Major General Mustafa Belosif, who was charged with the misuse of state funds. 6.6 6 million of them. In November of 1988, the Algerian constitution was amended, which allowed the formation of other political parties outside the ruling FLN. Shortly afterward, the Islamic Salvation Front, or FIS, would form in Algeria. In 1991, the military intervened to stop elections from bringing the FIS to power. From the chaos came several armed groups and a long and brutal Algerian civil war.
Budiev attempts to disassemble these armed groups, having thousands of FIS members arrested. Roughly six months after taking office, the Algerian native was gunned down at a cultural center in Annapur. Immediately, a lone bodyguard was said to have been the assassin, with no help from the outside. Islamic Ahmed, an Algerian Islamist group with notable backers. Despite the biography, the group's inception was made possible by the former Islamic Armed Movement member, Mansour Meliani. In 1991, a counterintelligence specialist would reveal one of the Algerian army's best kept secrets. Mohamed Samarari, an Algerian army deputy chief counterintelligence specialist, resigns from his post repelled at the information he was made aware of, apparently too late. Stating that, in late 1991, the GIA was formed by the Algerian army to weaken and destroy the Islamic Salvation Front, an Islamist party ready for the upcoming 1992 elections, which Budiev would ultimately come out on top of. One year after the gruesome scene in Annaba, a man returns from Al-Qaeda training in an Afghan camp, and minus an eye. His name is Mokhtar Bel Mokhtar. He is an Algerian native and the newest member of the GIA. After a string of terror attacks in the 1990s, Bel Mokhtar had caught the attention of intelligence officials worldwide. By 2003, he was listed by the United Nations as an Al-Qaeda-affiliated terrorist and financier. In addition, the GIA was also listed on a U.S. State Department list of foreign terrorist organizations banned from operating on U.S. soil. However, not banned elsewhere in the West. GIA members have also found home in parts of France and the city of London. Sheikh Abu Qatada communicating military orders to GIA members working out of Algeria and France. Qatada was given political asylum in Britain in 1992 after being condemned to death in the Algiers airport bombing that killed nine, wounding 125. At the same time, working in Pakistan with a number of Afghani Mujahideen groups. Of these countries in the West and Middle East, nowhere in Bel Mokhtar's background is he linked with any Canadian organization. However, Algerian Prime Minister Abdel Malik Salah announced the January 2013 enemyness attack had been coordinated by two Canadians. Despite Western reports, the attack was planned and prepared by Bel Mokhtar alone. John Baird just wrapped up meetings with ambassadors from France, Mali, and the Ivory Coast. French troops are now on the ground in Mali. They're moving north to territory occupied by insurgents tied to Al Qaeda. Let's let me just move to a different situation. Is, is, is there uh, a hostage, a Canadian hostage in Algeria right now? Can you confirm it? And early reports out, and we can't confirm it, that Islamists have killed a Canadian hostage in Algeria. That's just emerging again. We can't confirm it. This is what we're hearing now. Can you give I us any indication? I can't confirm it either. What we have seen is a significant number of media reports. Uh, we have heard that the one Canadian is safe. We've heard other media reports saying he's not. Uh, we've heard other reports that he's a landed immigrant, not in fact a Canadian citizen. Uh, our mission, obviously, in Algiers is working with our headquarters in Ottawa to get to, to the bottom of it and to see what uh, we can do to provide assistance. Obviously, we're horrified with the 41 hostages uh, which, are being, uh, which have been uh, taken in Algeria and uh, are obviously going to work with our allies to see what can't be done. Right. Uh, this was a, we're hearing, this was a Canadian hostage who was a chief of security of the oil refinery. Again, iTelevision, a French TV station, is reporting that Islamists have executed that person. Again, I'm not confirming this. iTelevision is. And I know you're hearing this for the first time, so no confirmation on that yet. I can't confirm it. Well, I'd say, listen, uh, obviously the fight against international terrorism is the great struggle of our generation. Uh, there's no doubt we're seeing, uh, you know, uh, a rise in terrorism in many, many parts of the world. Uh, but we're not going to, you know, send Canadian troops into combat uh, at the drop of a hat. All right. Uh, I should just say, this is all coming in literally as I'm speaking to the minister, so I appreciate the fact that you're not looking at your BlackBerry, but I happen to be looking at mine. Uh, CP is now reporting that ADDS is employ the employer uh, of the... Um, 
Canadian there says that the Canadian is safe in Algeria. So we just, these reports are coming in uh, both sides. So I appreciate exactly what you said. You don't know if it was Canadian, if he's safe or not. So that's one ongoing. Western news agencies reported Mr. Marlborough as the mastermind of the enemy's attack. An attack a January 21st Reuters article states Bel Mokhtar wasn't even present for. The full identity of the Canadians, how they joined the GIA, and who got them to Algeria are questions that were put on the shelf, followed by arguments of emotion. Racist alert, racist alert. This is a bit where you start uh, saying all that Michael Corrin. He's a terrible racist, isn't he? Uh, couldn't care less. Have to say this. Whenever we hear about uh, Canadians or, or, or Brits or Swedes or Danes who are parts of, of Islamic terror groups, I always cringe rather because, look, I, I don't care where you were born or really what your attitudes are, but if you're a Canadian, you have a, a loyalty to Canada. You may criticize aspects of its governance, that's fine, but you love the country. And there are people who claim to be or are described as being British or Canadian or Scandinavian and commit acts of terror. And when you look into them, they may be the accident of citizenship. And I'll use that phrase again, if you like, the accident of citizenship. They were born in a certain country or they managed to have that citizenship tenuously, tentatively. Their actions dictate that they have hatred, if anything, for that nation, for that Western nation. And I say this because just today we found out, that it, it seems at least, that two Al-Qaeda members who were found dead in Algeria were Canadian. David Harris, a former CSIS officer from uh, Insignia Strategic Research, joins us now from Ottawa. Welcome to you, David. Hello, Michael. Uh, Canadian? Well, it may depend how we define Canadian. You've indicated that there are now certain variations on the theme that even embrace some of our arch enemies. If individuals in the Canadian government are involved in sponsoring terrorism for the West, the findings of the RCMP investigating in Algeria will probably never reach Canadian newsrooms. CTV removes an interview from their website in which security expert Alan Bell states, Canadians have been training in the Middle East for years. Moving from what appears to be the suppression of news, we look to the oil companies operating out of Enaminas. Sonatrach is the Algerian state oil company that runs the Enaminas site, along with British Petroleum and Norway's Snat Oil. Hostage Alan Wright stated the GIA terrorists were dressed the same as security forces indicating the security placed around the foreign workers was ultimately infiltrated. Infiltrated by someone who had the power to breach a highly secured area. These were the thoughts and research of Anis Romani, editor of an Algerian newspaper who was briefed by security officials. Algeria and Norway officials report in the Telegraph the attack could not have been carried out without help from the inside. Surviving hostages points to clues the terror group was familiar with the facility. Louis Caprioli, advisor at GEO's, the risk management group and former domestic intelligence agent, stated the installations are highly protected and the operation must have been prepared for some time. Confronted with this humiliating information, a BP spokesman would not comment on this claim. Instead, he stated, it wasn't the time to be reviewing security arrangements, and their efforts were focused on providing support to the families of the victims. Unconcerned with possible accomplices inside oil plant security, the French officer later revealed to be with the jihadists, and the warnings years in advance of the attack. BP spokesmen and Canadian government officials opted not to comment any further on these embarrassing details. Six weeks after the Enemines attacks, 1,400 miles to the southeast, the government of Chad had an announcement. The Chadian military forces intervening in Mali have totally destroyed the main jihadi and terrorist base in the Ifo Gas Mountain region. Many terrorists were killed, among them their leader Mukhtar Bel Mukhtar. Reports of his death follow the funerals of Chadian troops who've been fighting in Mali alongside French and Malian forces. And this news comes after days of fighting in the Adra de Ifogas Mountains in Mali. Belmokhtar, a veteran Algerian jihadist, 
His centre have either died in an airstrike earlier this week, along with dozens of his fighters, or at the hands of a Chadian assault. Details are sketchy. In March 2013, Abu Qatada was arrested for a bail breach, but not for any connection to any counter-terrorism operation. Yes, with the alleged death of Mr. Marlborough and the arrest of Abu Qatada, the case of what really happened fades away from news broadcasts, websites, and subsequently enough, the memory of the masses. America will remain the anchor of strong alliances in every quarter of the globe. And we will renew those institutions that extend our capacity to manage crisis abroad. For no one has a greater stake in a peaceful world than its most powerful nation. We will support democracy from Asia to Africa, from the Americas to the Middle East, because our interests and our conscience compel us to act on behalf of those who long for freedom. My fellow Americans, the oath I have sworn before you today like the one recited by others who serve in this capital, was an oath to God and country, not party or faction. And we must faithfully execute that pledge during the duration of our service. But the words I spoke today are not so different from the oath that is taken each time a soldier signs up for duty or an immigrant realizes her dream. My oath is not so different from the pledge we all make to the flag that waves above and that fills our hearts with pride. They are the words of citizens, and they represent our greatest hope. You and I, as citizens, have the power to set this country's course. You and I, as citizens, had the obligation to shape the debates of our time, not only with the votes we cast, but with the voices we lift in defense of our most ancient values and enduring ideals. Thanian, <laughs> هي ليست موجهة لمن لا يريد أن يحاور وبالتالي سنسمع الآن منذ اليوم الكثير من الرفض من قبل الجهات التي تعرفونها فنحن نقول لهم مسبقا لماذا ترفضون شيئا هو ليس موجه لكم بالأساس كي لا يضيع وقته I have obviously followed closely uh, public opinion, and I think it's um, fair to say that uh, the United States for the last uh, decade has not been uh, viewed favorably by a very high percentage of uh, the people in any of the countries uh, in the Middle East or North Africa for a number of reasons, some of it rooted, of course, in our strong support for Israel um, over uh, the many years of Israel's uh, existence as a state. Uh, so this is not the Obama administration, the Bush administration, the Clinton administration. This is uh, the views of many uh, people in uh, the region about um, America. And I think it's unfortunate uh, because, you know, clearly what the United States stands for is absolutely in line with what uh, the Arab uh, revolutions uh, have been uh, publicly uh, هناك منظمة تعنى بموضوع الإرهاب لا أذكر ما اسم هذه المنظمة من حوالي شهر أو أكثر بقليل أصدرت تقرير حول تراجع الأعمال الإرهابية بشكل عام خاصة في منطقة أواسط وشرق آسيا صحيح لأن معظم الإرهابيين أتوا إلى سوريا من معظم هذه الدول والبعض منهم يأتي من الدول الغربية They threaten us very directly They have insisted they will bring their jihad to Europe and they will bring it to North America. Um, uh, if they are allowed to establish a base, they will be much better prepared to do just that. But I, I don't agree with what I heard earlier, that the Western powers are backing the rebels. If uh, President Assad had agreed to talk to them in the beginning, 
we would not have had these extremists joining him. Uh, Qatar has provided a ton of weapons and financing, and Qatar is the headquarters for the UK and the US and the Middle East uh, for all of the uh, military operations and all of the actual uh, weaponry uh, going in and out is coming through uh, Turkey and Iraq. So. You can't say that the U.S. is not involved in Syria. We believe that America must continue to be the indispensable nation and the global leader on behalf of peace, prosperity, and uh, progress, and that that requires us not only to lead alone, but also to build coalitions and networks uh, that will put responsibility uh, with others and expect them to play their role uh, in a rules-based uh, global order. You could say that our power is a figment of our enemy's imagination. It might be absolutely true. Uh, we are not claiming to be running the world. Uh, our job is just to think.